here he is, uh, Mr. Sam Adequi, and uh, we're going to get started right away. And I'm going to uh, first off welcome you. I've got some images to show you and some bio to show you as well. And I want to tell you just how extraordinarily uh, privileged we are to have Sam Adequi here join us this evening to talk about his work, talk about his books, and to uh, reveal his wisdom, uh, which he has a healthy supply of, as many of you know. So my name is Dan Thompson, and I'm the Dean of Fine Arts of Studio in Kaminati. And I want to thank Jared Fisher for his abundant technical support this evening for helping us all get situated. And so let's get rolling on this uh, April 21st edition of the Bennett Schmidt Lectures on the Higher Aim of Art. Sam Adequi, the great Sam Adequi, uh, he is here for the Higher Aim of Art. Uh, Sam's bio, Sam Adequi's uniqueness in turning nature and people into beautiful timeless paintings that inspire future generations. Sam Adequi is not only an artist, but also the author of Origin of Inspiration, a Strand Books number one bestsellers. Origin of Inspiration, a treatise on the best way to live a creative life is full of ideas, Rolling Stone magazine says in October of 2014. In October 2019, Origin of Inspiration won the Manhattan Book Award. In the 21st century art world, the African-born Samuel Adequi follows the historical tradition of creative minds who challenge themselves with unfamiliar territory. American artists looked to Europe and Picasso looked to African art for inspiration. Upon Samuel Adequi's arrival in the United States, while still a student, he won several international awards, including the Gold Medal in Oil Painting and Best Traditional Oil Painting Awards at the Knickerbocker Artist International Exhibition. He is the first and only African to teach in all of the prestigious art institutions and academies in New York City. His bio continues. The artist's paintings have appeared on the covers of books, magazines, newspapers, including a highly favorable New York Times article about Mr. Adequi's painting, The Legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. Last year, a short documentary film about the artist, The Unseen Beauty, directed by Gabriel Di Orioste, was screened at the Manhattan Film Festival, the Brooklyn Academy of Music, and several film festivals across the United States. Mr. Adequi's artworks have been exhibited at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., and at other galleries and museums. The artist's portraits are in the collections of the Harvard Club, New York City, Columbia University, New York, the Elliott Museum in Stewart, Florida, the National Museum of Naval Aviation in Pensacola, Florida, the Long Island Museum of Art, Chateau Pequeny, Bergerac, France, and in many other private collections. Recently, the city of Pompor, Bergerac, France, awarded Mr. Adequi the city's Medal of Honor for his contribution and dedication to the arts and culture of the area. In 2011, Mr. Adequi was invited to join the Board of Advisors to the Portrait Society of America. So uh, Sam is a, an eminent teacher and artist, and uh, I have always known about him uh, being a practitioner of various teaching in New York myself. I knew about him through the National Academy and through many friends. And Sam, I wanna welcome you again, and thank you for being here. I also want to uh, make everybody aware before we get started that Sam is a celebrated author and has authored several books, including How Successful Artists Study and Origin of Inspiration and his newer book, The Skin Tones in Art, as well as other texts. I have a particular interest in these two books, Origin of Inspiration and Skin Tones in Art, a short story of Skin Tones in Art, because I have two copies of them which just arrived and, uh, and were autographed. And I wanna kind of begin, Sam, if you don't mind, I'd like to share some uh, of your writing with everybody. Is that okay? Of course, I mean, whatever will help was fine. Beautiful, I, I wanna read this quote of yours, which I transcribed out of your book, Origins of Inspiration today, because uh, I think it gets us started and it, it, it's an opportunity to, to hear more from you about your points of view and, and your great wisdom. Uh, you say, passion is a reward given to us long before an accomplishment is realized or a duty fulfilled. It is a reward just like others, such as success, money, prizes, and recognition. But unlike those rewards that one gets from the finished accomplishment, 
passion is invisible and intangible. It comes from the form of a spell. It comes in the form of a spell from the supreme intelligence. Would you talk a little more about that? Um, I, I, guess, I, I guess so. It's, I think uh, this is something that uh, most uh, great, most people who follows a certain kind of dream and uh, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what the situation, the environment are, you see that the dream is the only thing that is at stake. And therefore, sometimes you watch people and you ask, what is this that is driving this person to go through all the suffering, all the pain, all the journey and not giving up? Why? Why can't we just sometimes just easily give up a dream and just follow the flow? Why, why is it that something could be so strong, so forceful that we cannot stop? And that's when I realized that it's actually it's the spell of passion. Once you are beaten by that spell of passion, uh, you are no longer a match. And uh, I, I strongly believe that uh, we are sent to this earth to do great things. Um, I, sometimes when I say, look, the universe and men have a very transactional situation. I give you talent and you use it for this. I give you height, you use it for this. I give you muscle and you use it for this. So do talent. When you are giving that talent, you are bound to use it for something. And if you're lucky enough, you will find out what your call is. And once you find out what your call is, that's when then you are offered that kind of spell so that nothing at all can get in the way. So in some way, uh, give an artist a great dream, give them the vision, put them on a journey, and then energize them with that passion. And once they got that passion, it is very difficult to stop in the middle. So one will say that if that is the case, where do I find a passion to follow my own dream? It's very, very simple. Just find out what you think your mission in life is. Find out what the purpose, why do you have to follow this? How is this going to help the universe evolve? And I will, as I often put it, we are sent here to sometimes chisel the edges of the rough edges of evolution. So once you realize that you too can help a bit chiseling the rough edges of evolution, you have no choice than the universe offering you that spell to go along with it because it's rough out there. Without that spell, it is very easy to lose everything. So passion, therefore, is not just something that you say you want to have passion, I want, no. First, you have to have a good purpose. Second, you have to uh, prove to the universe that you are willing to help. And then the universe will offer you the passion to continue the journey. That's beautifully said. And uh, I wanna share some of your work as we share ideas. And first of several paintings, and while I share uh, these beautiful paintings, I want to ask you, uh, when did you discover, at what age were you when you discovered that you have that passion, that you couldn't turn it off, that it drove you uh, to almost extraordinary means and ends to accomplish your, you know, your dream? Uh, uh, that's, a, that's actually, that's a question that is so funny, a question, yet it's so true, because I can remember exactly the day that happened. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I used to, at the age of 10, believe it or not, I used to sell newspapers and believe, I used to wake up with, I used to wake up with a couple of friends and I was from an upper class, but I like to live with the rough guys. And there are some, there's something about me that I had always wanted to live with people who are very different from the culture, from uh, from people from my tribe or from where I come from. So these friends that I used to know, they 
for hustling's sake, they wake up like 4 a.m., 5 a.m. to sell newspapers. So I started to join them at the age of 10. Of course, please, no one should go and tell my parents because they didn't know. They still didn't know I did that when I was 10. And I used to deliver a newspaper to a guy. And sometimes, because I was so young, he would open the doors for me to drop off the newspaper, or he would keep the doors open. Ghana is often hot, so no, most people don't leave their doors uh, closed. And once I went there Saturday to deliver a newspaper, and I saw that behind there, he, he, he called me to come and drop off the newspaper. And when I went back, he was painting billboards. And I was so fascinated by the billboards that I decided that this guy, now when I drop off the newspaper, every week, instead of coming to take the money, I'll pretend as if I forgot to take the money, so I will not come. And I did that so much that he traced me, found me, and said, hey, why can't you come and get your money? And I said, oh, but I like your art so much. I don't want to charge <laughs> you because I want to come in so that you, uh, to make up for uh, the money, I like to come in and watch you. And he was like, no, you don't have to do that. So once I went there and stayed there for all day, but he was surprised that at my age, I was coming there and have, I, I don't go home. So he decided to trace, Ghana is a, uh, we live in a very tribal family oriented. So it is very easy that when you mention your name, someone can easily trace where you come from. Uh -huh. so the guy I traced my parents, actually my uncles, and he told them, you know, your boy has been delivering newspaper and he will come to my studio and he doesn't want to leave. <laughs> And they were like, of course, I was living with my uncles. My father was not around. My mother was not around. So my uncles, for, so far as they're concerned, so far as I'm keeping myself busy. So I told the guy that, you, you know, when I come in on Saturdays, I like to uh, do some ironing for you, clean up for you and everything, just so that I will see what you do. And he said, no, you don't have to do anything. Just come and help me work. And that's when I saw that I got the ball, that I couldn't do anything else but than to uh, follow that path of painting. So it started off as a billboard. Got it. Well, so I have to ask, what did your family say when they, especially when they realized that there was no, um, there was no telling you no, there was no dissuasion that they could possibly think <laughs> of that, that would keep you away from this? Then many things I did in life, my family didn't know. <laughs> a classic example after newspapers I, I while I was I think 12 or maybe 13 uh, I, I did I don't I wouldn't say I did well in school but I know I always have the best grades to do or to go through the system faster than the average so it, it wasn't because of any reason but just I was I, I excel so at 13, 14, I was taking part-time courses in accounting and, uh, and other uh, accounting. So I remember one day I was going to school. It was a part-time course and I have to travel about one and a half hours. Then I was always, all my life since childhood, I always like to improve myself when I was in uh, eight, I used to follow people to boxing club and learn boxing. And I followed, I did boxing all the way until I left Ghana. So I always have this innate desire to improve myself. I think maybe that desire is what actually had made me more than my talent. But I was going to school and I met a friend of mine who we used to be in primary school together. We used to uh, do things and play together. And I remember I used to be better uh, draw, I used to draw better than him. And my friend showed me his uh, new works and I was blown away. And I, I couldn't understand why I have not seen my friend painting, but all of a sudden he's this good. So I asked him what happened. So, and then he said, you know, there's a school called 
Opportunities Industrialization Center. It was founded by an American, uh, I think an American industrialist who came to Ghana uh, for free education and everything. So he said, hey, if you join me, maybe today, um, most of the students will come in and you will have friends to talk to. You can visit the class for at least a day and then tomorrow you can go to school. Then I went to the school, that was the end. I never returned back to anything. And now my parents come in. So the school said, if I want to join the school, I should bring my parents. I think they call, there's a name for it. But you, you bring someone to sign up for you. And I know for sure my mother wasn't gonna do that. I know my uncles weren't gonna do that. So I went and bribed somebody who, uh, an older guy who sometimes I gave him newspapers and things. And I asked him to come with me and act as if it was, he was my parent. And we went to the school uh, <laughs> and opportunities in industrialization center. He signed up for me and I did the school for two years. So my parents, my parents actually, uh, it took them over maybe 15 years before they realized what I was doing. Because I left Ghana and went to Nigeria and they didn't know what I was working on. But when they finally realized they could see how successful and how happy you are and were at the time and they were supportive, right? Uh, not quite. <laughs> Then don't forget I'm from a different culture. Uh, Mercedes Benz is better than a great artist. If the great artist cannot afford a lot of things, or a little house on the hill is more accomplished than the artist. So anything that brings home the bacon is actually better than being a great artist. So my pair. As I said before, I used to, I, I did well, maybe I excel. So my, for my mother, she had always seen me doing well. So whenever you say, oh, Sam is artist and this, you say, oh, my son, oh, my son. He, she didn't take me that serious. And my uncles and everyone, they, 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 they don't care because we don't care how great you are. Where is your Mercedes Benz? Where is your house? So African culture, as advanced as they are, sometimes we are not so in tune to uh, what it takes to become an artist. So only until recently when I started writing and uh, I told my mother, by the way, I've written a book. And you know what my mother said? She said oh, my son, you've tried, that's all. <laughs> but she said that with such a dignity and such a, it's the kind of thing that you, they praise you, he, she praised you so much, but it came in a very beautiful, beautiful way that you know exactly that, um, you know exactly what she meant. And, and I have to also say that in Africa, sometimes we are not like hero worshipers. So it doesn't matter how big you are, how much you've accomplished, your parents will just, they will tap you on the back and say, oh, you, it has been a great battle and you've tried very much, welcome home. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Wow. Let me um, share another quote from this terrific book, which I found very deeply moving, uh, called Origin of Inspiration. When you say art does not change men's nature, profound ideas do. I wanted to ask you, now that we've, covered just a little bit of your formative years and you're learning your craft, you're learning your visual language. What was your first aesthetic or artistic profound idea? The, the, I think the idea of, I had often uh, said that uh, skill do not make the man, but ideas make the man. Uh, skill do not make great art, but great mind creates great art. Uh, have a great mind and chances are you will uh, find means. The means to do great things are always available. It takes more of a great mind to go search for what is worthy of your journey, 
what is worthy of your mission and what is worthy of the short life you are living in this world. And if you don't have a great mind or if you have not cultured, I, I don't think I have a great mind, but I like to think I have cultured myself to think a little uh, more in order to get more from what I have or what I have been gifted with or what I have um, been lucky enough to nurture because of the circumstances or because of the environment America has given me. So uh, uh, if you take all this environment, if you take American out of my life, if you take out all the good people I have met in my life, I don't really think I would be sitting here. So in the end, what do all these people, how do I honor them with the talent that I've been given? Well, two days ago, I was telling my student, a student of mine, that, you know, it's funny, but whenever I have to work, I'm always thinking of all the great people I've met, great uh, things I've met, the chances that has, give, has been given to me, and I'm always feel like, oh, I hope I can honor them. I hope, I hope one day they will look at me and say that, oh, we are so happy to have helped this guy on the way. So I never work for myself. It, it, my student was laughing at me because she didn't understand that concept. And I said to her, it's true. Uh, even my students, friends, like for example, you, you think this is weird, but just by meeting you then alone, I feel like, oh, wow, I hope if I do something, hopefully, maybe it will make them proud that he, he was able to work with me. I, I was always in tune or uh, concerned with the journey I'm making and the good people I'm meeting and how is my presence helping make them feel proud of what I have become. So it, it is the mind that one always have to culture first. It is, in the world we're living in then, it is very, 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 very easy to start to follow how many likes do I have, to follow how many following do I have. It is very, very, very easy to start to uh, go off your track and start to make noise just to be heard. It is very easy to um, forget what the journey is. And as I said, beginning, the universe, the universe works in a very transactional way with you. Do you wanna do great things? I will help you find the books to read. I will help you grow your knowledge. And then when I help you grow your knowledge and then I help you find all what you have to do, I will jolt you with some passion that you can endure a lot of suffering. And the reward for that curse of passion is you tend to be immune to how many likes do I have? How many following do I have? Because if you don't have that passionate curse, it is not that easy to remember that somewhere every night, you will click on your computer and you say, oh God, I have only two likes. Nobody likes me. I'm going to go back to create something that will be more people like. But I have a passion when you see two likes, I said, oh, well, you go in and start following uh, a dream that you have started and not finished. So I think great mind is uh, more important than the uh, tools that we got. Of course, the tools makes it easy. I, it would be very, very difficult for me to uh, be hypocrite to say no, that the tools makes things easier. Without tools, you will be fumbling around and you'll be torturing yourself and with everything. But the great mind will always help the tool achieve unbelievable things. That's, that's beautifully said, Sam. And I was going to ask you, uh, after that, as a follow-up question, what made the first profound idea profound? Was it the idea itself or was it where you were at the time? And, and I can see that 
it was where you were and it was the idea, but mainly it was about your education and how that, how that delivers you to the realization that on the one hand, you have the likes and the accolades. And on the other hand, you have that intangible passion that you mentioned. And it's by, you know, there's no competition. The passion really is the gist. It's, it's the engine and the driver of everything that you yearn to do. And it's something to be embraced. The, the, um, the thing is, I mean, I hope you guys can see that I'm a black man, right? Just kidding. And the thing is, I came to adopt a culture and then uh, I came to adopt a culture. And in this culture, there is only two things you can do that you can get praises. Music, dancing, maybe theater, or maybe uh, movies. Apart from that, few couple of things, the doctors, the lawyers, the scientists are all in the background. So I was like, if I'm going to pursue art, it could be nice to bring my people up on the uh, map that, hey, we don't just do abstract artists. Uh, we, don't just, uh, we don't just do abstract art. We don't just pursue uh, things that is hard to understand. If given the chance, we can also do very well. So that profound idea came in at a point where I was like, it could be nice to maybe paint something uh, that at least can tell the world or can tell the public that, oh, these guys or these people or these uh, underprivileged artists, if we give them the chance, they will do as well and help society move on. So that profound idea came in when I decided to do the Martin Luther King painting and the Kennedy painting. Because the Martin Luther King painting and the Kennedy painting, honestly, I just did that just to, not to uh, prove, because I don't believe in proving, but to show that I have the talent. Given the chance, I can do things. And given the chance, my people, my friends, other artists, other underprivileged African artists, given the chance they can do. So that profound uh, idea that just do one or two paintings so that you are not always seen as someone who can excel only in certain fields or in certain styles. So that uh, the Martin Luther King painting and then the Kennedy painting followed by um, the social studies that I forgot to give you the uh, image of. So those three paintings were that profound uh, images that helped me uh, make that tangible that yes, if given the chance, uh, one can um, produce things that are beyond what people were expecting. Fantastic. I want to ask you, I have another quote in a second, but if you had another word, because I want to drill down on this word passion, it's a beautiful word. And, and I, I also want to swap out words like inspiration, okay. in addition to passion. But if you had a word, uh, you mentioned being from another culture, what would the word be in Africans for passion, if you were to swap that word out? Ah, uh, uh, then this is trouble. The other time, <laughs> the other time I was uh, one of my best friend who is very, very, very uh, well educated, very smart guy. Ask him, by the way, how would I translate inspiration to my mother, to, for my mother to understand? Then we could not come out with a word. A word. <laughs> we couldn't because it would take maybe sentences to make that word. Clear. So we unless honestly, unless maybe I don't know or he doesn't know, but to be very honest with you, I could not explain inspiration to my own mother and my cousins and relatives who had gone to school always in Ghana, they could not give me one word. So what the, could I explain inspiration maybe in our language, I would say, uh, when blessed by the gods, because we, 
my my mother is a, a tribal leader. Uh, she is uh, the one who uh, maintains the uh, spiritual gods for my tribe. And we, when we talk, we talk more of what the gods wants you to, what the gods have blessed you with, what the gods would like you to do. It, it's a very, it's always maybe humbling that you are not alone. And uh, this was not given to you just to show up, or this was not given to you just to um, um, be proud or to just paint for painting's sake. Uh, this was given you to uh, help others find their way. So I think oh, it will be more of a uh, bless from the gods. Fantastic. It must be why your book is so inspiring. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Uh, the story behind this book, and uh, maybe I, I'm going to make it very fast so that I don't. Uh, I had written uh, uh, the How Successful Artists Study and Origin of Inspiration. And I was like, oh, you know, Sam, you don't know anything about the American language. So get the best uh, editor in the country. And so that you make sure that you're not going to embarrass yourself. So there, there was an um, editor, very, very, very good. I think uh, she deserved a plug, uh, Jennifer King. And so I said, oh, Jennifer, could you please find me somebody to edit? And Jennifer was like, oh, Sam, you know, I'm, I'm very, very busy. I got a new job. And maybe I'm going to find you all the editors I have worked with. And... <laughs> and uh, they, they will help you. Then nine to 11 editors rejected the book. Wow. Nine, to, they said this book that's not worth writing. So uh, I, the day, Jennifer didn't call me, but the day was, after some days I called Jennifer and she started crying on the phone mm. and it, I thought something has happened to her, but Jennifer was crying. So I said, Jennifer, uh, why are you crying? And she was like, but they didn't have to do this to you. What a big reject. <laughs> and I said, Jennifer, hey, for me to be what I am, do you know how many rejections I have failed in my, I've gotten in my life? Yeah. So this is nothing at all. Yeah. So I took the manuscript with my tail between my legs, put the manuscript somewhere and never saw the manuscript again. So years passed and there was a lady who was in my, was in my class and I don't often get to know my students very, very well when they are new. But this time, well, there was something about her that I feel like, oh, maybe I should reach out uh, to make her feel a little more comfortable. So I was speaking with her and she told me, oh, by the way, I asked her what do you used to do. And she said, oh, I used to be an editor. And I, my eyes went bling, bling. <laughs> so now if 11 people have rejected you, like this in Africa, they say, if you have been beaten by a snake before, you run away when you see worms. So I didn't ask her right away, but a couple of days passed and I said, by the way, you know, what does it take to write a book? I have some manuscript." to look at it and she looked at me she was like Sam everything I am only in your class because of your mind whatever you do I'm sure there's yes, a lot of things we could always work it out so well, she was like if you like this Sunday this Saturday I will come in Saturday classes I will come in and then take a look at the manuscript and then I will tell you what it will take to do she came to the studio she looked at the manuscript and she was like oh you've done everything I just have to clean up the language. It's a little different from the books out there, but I think it's gonna do well. She took the book within a couple of weeks, the books was done. And that was how this book became. Fantastic. Yeah. What a great story. Well, speaking of your mind, this is another very interesting quote from your book, Origins of Inspiration, which I highly recommend. 
You say, after 30 years of teaching painting and teaching art, I still don't know if art imitates life or if life imitates art, but experience tells me that all meaningful purpose gets rewarded. Um, the thing is, as I said before, it's so important to follow up what is going on on social media. We need that platform. Actually, social media now has become like our portfolio and everything. But if you lose track of why we have been gifted to do art, it is very easy to lose track of meaningful art. The, this afternoon, I was speaking to a student and I was saying, I was just trying to explain to her that take a meaningful purpose. If you sincerely believe it is so important for humanity and people will gain for it, sooner or later, people will catch up, no matter what the thing is, no matter what the medium is. So in the end, it is more important to have a meaningful reason. Again and again, I like to really, really go back to this, especially with young artists. The universe works in a transactional way. I want to help people, and the universe will help you succeed. I want to help my friend, and the universe will make it easy for you to succeed. The universe do not want myopic, selfish, talent. You might get some few attention. You might do some few great things. You might get the claps. You might do the things, seasonal things, because the times uh, wants it. You might do some things where many people believe this is a time to do this. But the universe will not stop in seasonal. The universe goes on. So anytime you have a purpose that has something to offer the universe, you will be rewarded in return. Beautiful. Uh, let me ask you then on another terrific image. These are beautiful. These, these figures and forms of prayer are yeah. just lovely. Uh, what do you love most about your own creative journey, Sam? And the love of people. Uh, the love of people. I really, 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 uh, feel super privileged to live also in the times where I can see all the beauty of nature's creation. Just imagine, I could have a Danish friend, I could have a Chinese student, I could have an African uh, teacher, I could have um, a Mexican friend. I mean, then imagine living in 15th century in maybe Holland. <laughs> Do you know how many Orientals and Asians you will see, Africans you will see, uh, Mexicans you will see? So one thing, I think one thing that I love most about my trip or my journey is the constant uh, joy of nature uh, sending different people uh, to me, different people, different minds, different religion, uh, different beliefs, different goals in life, a uh, different way of tackling things. And all of these people, I get to see them and work with them or enjoy their mind. Wonderful, wonderful. There are some, uh, I'm checking the chat box and they're asking about your book. It is indeed called The Origin of Inspiration. That is the one I've been quoting. Yeah. We also have the newer book. This is the one you were speaking of that is yeah. manuscript, correct? Yes, this is a fantastic book. This is a recent text. And I noticed it has friends like, uh, like Leona Shanks, as well as Ismail Checo and Nelson Shanks in the yeah. book. So. There's some great friends in here as well. By the way, also the audience must also know that I also have get, I gained a lot from Shanks. I was in Shanks class, so it is uh, no secret that I've become good. I think uh, <laughs> anyone who is associated with anything Shanks is doing is hard, very hard to go wrong. I think Shanks is uh, one of the humans that when you meet, you know you have met somebody with uh, a purpose or you have met somebody with a demand that goes beyond the average. So uh, it, it, it is 
So I, I think I will be, it will be so unfair if I can take every credit for myself. I think Shane's, I, I didn't stay there that long, but the thing is, as they say, a word to a wife is enough. So I didn't say uh, in his class, but it was in his class. I made the most beautiful friends, the most beautiful minds, and the most ambitious, uh, hardworking people. Um, Shanks spoke to me a couple. Shanks spoke to me a couple of days, and I, actually he invited me to Pennsylvania. But at the time he invited me, he, he has no clue that I was just struggling guy trying to make ends meet, and I could not afford uh, a lot of. Things. So it, it, it is one of these situations where maybe the universe is in align our um, other meetings at uh, Pennsylvania. But um, there's nothing I can say than the greatest guy, the greatest hard worker, uh, the, the kind of person one would say by association, you even could learn more than just by uh, learning. So I I, I, I cannot sit here without ever thinking he doesn't have a share to uh, what, I've, uh, what I've become. And the things that are coming out of the school, I can see that the teachers are maintaining that kind of philosophy. I see uh, some amazing, beautiful words coming from that uh, studio in community. So it's all because of the power and the, the demands that uh, Shanks influences. Well, thank that's, you. That's why, oh, by the way, you have to, sorry, sorry to cut yes. you short. By the way, in that book, I have only three living artists and Shanks uh, then was one and Leona and uh, B and- Ron Cher. Yeah, and Ron Cher. Ron Cher to an amazing, beautiful artist. Yes, yes. And, and you met amazing people in Nelson's class like Robin Fry, right? Yeah, Robin, uh, we <laughs> Robin, uh, without Robin, I don't know how long I will have stayed in the class because Robin was, they were very, very, very welcoming. I think the, you know, when I came to the country first, I don't know, maybe I, I used to look very timid. I mean, there's a self-portrait that actually I did with the mustache. And one of the reasons why I did that self-portrait was to scare all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think, Maybe now that they know the secret, now they will not scare of me. But I remember that I was in the class when I did, I think when I did that self-portrait. And I remember everybody was pushing me. People used to push me around a lot when I was at the league. You also have to remember that when I was at the league, I was the only black student in the whole school studying. So the, the chemistry was always, uh, something I was not familiar with. Uh, so I guess to put on that little mustache just to scare my mates out was a very good thing to do. Mm, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Wow. Uh, let me um, ask you about a particular painting, if I may. And as I'm transitioning to that screen, uh, there's a great question that came in about whether your experiences as an author, as a celebrated best-selling author, have they changed your painting uh, in any way, shape, or form? Um, it has changed more than I ever thought it would change. Because when, because English is not my major, when, when I have to put a phrase down, a sentence down, or a paragraph down, I love to compose words like I would do with painting. So I became very, very, very hard on myself when I'm writing because I want everything to sound very, very good. Then when I came back to painting, I realized that I wasn't looking at painting the same way like I used to. Everything have to have a place. Everything have to have a meaning and every stroke have to say something. So the same kind of ethical uh, discipline from writing, when I brought it to painting, it made painting more difficult than it has ever been. I, 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 um, it is 
easy for me to say when I didn't know so much, painting was easier than when I knew, when I started to write. Because when I didn't know so much, the model sees there, I have a certain goal, I get, I capture it, I have the skill, I have everything to capture it, to capture what I needed from the model. But then when I started writing, I started to go to these metaphysical reasons why I should paint uh, the universe. What is this painting going to do? Why should I paint one more apple? And uh, why should I not be concerned about who is going to look at this apple? Uh, why should an apple be painted? So all those things, this metaphysical religion, and then on top of all that politics got into. So yes, writing changed my painting more than I thought. I used to, of course, people who know me, uh, I can do a life-size demo within a couple of hours and I can uh, nibble on the painting and do the details as many months as I want. But now it's not about details or it's not about just painting fast for fast sake, but it's about painting meaningful things, things that and when they get out of the studio, they will add to the world that I came and met uh, more than just uh, painting for painting's sake. So yes, uh, the intensity that I put into my writing, I, it could, didn't leave me after uh, writing. It came and followed me all the way to my paint brushes and my paints. That's very interesting. Yeah. Here's the painting I wanted to ask you about. It's your painting of the, jet, the death of John F. Kennedy. Would you talk a little bit about that? And while you do, would you describe some of the motivations behind it, as well as some of the technical aspects? Like, how did you know when you had finished this painting? And the thing is, um, if I tell you all the secrets, then I have to go and find you now. And then maybe break your hands just so that you don't use it. <laughs> No, of course I'm kidding. Um, I have this belief. I am not, I, I, I'm from Ghana, I've seen so much and I don't paint to prove myself. It's as simple as that. I am not painting to show that, hey, if you give me six months on this shirt, I can render it dead. If you, so I decided to invent a technique where you can have haiku, poetry, and essay in the same painting. So here you can see that I have expressionistic skill or expressionistic path of the painting. I have impressionistic path of the painting. And then I have the old classical part of the painting. And my, my main purpose for this reason is to show to young painters that you can combine those two, three, four techniques together on the same panel or on the same canvas. If you look at the pillar behind him, it's very expressionistic. If you look at the green uh, or the cloth that she, he's lying on, it's very impressionistic. And then if you look at the glazing technique behind them, it's very classical. So I was, I am always intrigued by different things. My, as a kid, my mother used to hold me very strong and start to like cry. Why can't you just play with your own kind? Why can't you just do what everyone is doing? And that had followed me all till now that whenever I'm doing something, I, I don't do just for the sake of despising, despise but I do because I believe that many things can come together. And if on the canvas that we all used to think it should be one technique, it should be one method, it should be that, if on the same canvas, I could bring the classical, old traditional to meet the impressionist and yet to have uh, expressionistic painting on one canvas without having problems with the uh, paint, why not? 
So this is one of the few paintings that actually shows my, the range of techniques I use. Yes, and I like where you're going in your writing, uh, where you try to make the distinction between alla prima and impressionism or expressionism or color study, that they're not the same thing. No, they are not the same, they're, they're not at all. Mm -hmm. And actually to be very honest with you, a, a higher percentage of painters, a higher, not a few, a higher percentage uh, misuses the word impressionist. So, I mean, uh, expressionism and impressionism are day and night. And so to do realistic and impressionism day and night too. Yes, yes, uh, I'm sorry. I would you like me to explain? No, no, uh, go ahead, yes, please. Okay. The thing is uh, expressionism, uh, if you look at the tradition and even if you look at the people who started or who followed or who believe in that tradition, expressionism means, hey, look at the sun or look at the figure. I don't have so much to explain, to paint it and everything, but I can express myself. So I see blue sky, therefore, I put the blue I see, not the blue that is going there, but the blue that makes me feel how I'm feeling. I see a sunny day, so this is how I feel. I will put colors down that helps me, um, help me communicate my feelings onto the canvas. Impressionism, on the other hand, means, hey, it's hard to be real, but I have the skill to put things that creates the impression of something, which means that if I'm looking for orange and I don't have enough time to explain, uh, to mix exactly that orange, I would like to think, ah, what about the impression of that orange? I see some yellow here, I see some red here, I see some pinks here. So impressionism, impressionism is actually trying to uh, put things that in the end, when combined, creates an impression of what you are seeing. Because as you know, you are a good colorist yourself, uh, my friend. You are a very good painter. Uh, most of your painting also fall within that. You cannot capture anything in life with one color. You might think you do because it's, uh, I'm not saying you, by the way. <laughs> uh, one cannot, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, Dan. Uh, one cannot capture uh, a color with one mixture because first of all, we have space. If I see an orange a mile away or two blocks away or maybe a yard away, that uh, orange is mixed with air, space, bounces, uh, things bounces on and on on, off and on. So trying to get it with one color is a very good thing to do. I do that all the time. But the word impressionism, it means since we cannot capture one thing with one color, try to get all the colors that could create the impression of the color which goes, it has some kind of Eastern philosophy. One color is everything, but everything makes one color. The yin and yang, one is all, all is one. Uh, I would like to read one or two more quotes from your book uh, called The Origins of Inspiration. By the way, Sam, there is a question about whether or not there is a plan to reissue this book because one or two of our participants have found it hard to get. Is it slated to be reissued? And the thing is, uh, that is the second edition, by the way. But they have to, I think, when uh, because of the pandemic, we took it from all the bookstore. So there's only one place you could order it. And uh, you go to originofinspiration.com and they will get it from there. But the pandemic is still affecting the distribution. So the, the best way now is to just go to originofinspiration.com 
And on the internet, people are selling it for like $200, $300. And two, three days ago, I got a call from India and the girls, I like the book, but I don't, I cannot pay $300. Is there a way I can get a PDF? So I just said, hey, go, why don't you go to Origin of Inspiration? And she got it from there. Fantastic. Wow. I've got a signed copy. Yeah. What do Origin of Inspiration, you, you will get it for like uh, maybe $15. And mm -hmm. also, uh, then what I wanted to uh, say to your following is, any, uh, whoever buys any of these books uh, decide that they will get the brush strokes also for, I will send them the brush strokes for free, the download version for free. Anyone coming from uh, Incaminati. Well, they're beautiful books, Sam, and they're easy reads and they're inspiring and they have great references and they refer back to awesome painters like Velasquez yeah. and Cezanne and Franz Halls and Rubens. So, there's a real connection and a genuine effort on your part to link together a lot of these great concepts. Yeah. You have a, a statement here. So it is our right to have passion as a tool to assist our ambitions. Ambition in a specific field without passion makes the work nine to, a nine to five job. And that really spells it out, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, imagine trying to paint an apple, but you don't know the reason why you are painting it. It becomes like a job. And imagine trying to pursue art, but you have no purpose, you have no mission, you have no vision, and, and you don't know why you are doing it. It will become a job. And that's why actually the origin of inspiration is find a good purpose, find a good reason, and chances are you will get also the vision. There are some things that the universe will give to you for free. You know, if a student comes to my class, and all of a sudden, I started seeing my students cleaning up my studio, doing all everything well. And the students is really, really into making the class do well. Then what will you do? You will do anything. You will ban for that student. That is the way the universe works. You, the, you, you, uh, we are gifted for a good reason. We are not gifted just because we are handsome or beautiful and oh, go there with it. We are gifted to use our gift to benefit others, to make others benefit from it. And whenever you take that kind of servitude approach to life, it is very, 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 very easy for the universe not to reward you. Sometimes when I say that, people say, hey, Sam, if that is the case, how come many artists suffer? How come many great artists suffer? The thing is, when you say many great artists suffer, sometimes we miss the point that what might make a lonely artist happy might not be a Mercedes Benz or might not be wealth. So we, from our material world, will look at somebody and say, this person is suffering so much, yet he's a great artist. So if Sam, that kind of um, transactional thing where really works, then no artist should suffer. No, that's wrong. I, you might not have all the Mercedes Benz, but maybe the kind of happiness, the inner happiness, the inner content, the inner calmness that you have might, not be, might be something that some people with all those things cannot get. So happiness comes in a very in a different form. Uh, happiness comes to different people in a different forms, in a different packages, in a different delivery. Uh, so we cannot equate an artistic happiness to a Wall Street happiness or to a scientist happiness. Indeed, I wish the entire school was listening to you right now. I see these threads in your writing and in your, your sort of demeanor and persona of idealism and yet humility. And the humility makes you stronger and more poised in your position. And I, I admire that. Yeah. The thing is, uh, Dan, you know something? In, um, in maybe 30 years or 50 years, I will not be here. We, we, don't, we, we say it's a bad luck. It's not bad luck. 
in 50 years, we are giving such a short time, such a short time to display and use our talent. Absolutely. What can you do? What must you do? Why rush? Why? So I really don't think I am, uh, my parents really just believes in the different beliefs and I also believe in what they believe. And uh, they, they, to them, they believe, Sam, when you meet people on the street, when people give you water, it is an angel who is giving you that water. If you meet somebody who help you uh, grow, if you meet somebody who gave you a job, if you meet somebody who uh, did something that changed your life, it is God or the angels working in a disguised way. So what, who are you and what are you to, to other people? If God disguises his messengers in a different way to come and help you, are you also gonna disguise yourself to other people? Uh, when I meet students uh, then, it's very simple. I don't see students in them. I see people who they are on their own mission. They are on their own journey to fulfill their own thing. They have their talent. They are on their mission to fulfill their duty to their maker. My goal is to help them get the tools they need and to constantly remember that they too, as I am, they too are on their path to fulfill their own mission. So don't get in the way. Don't tell them to take your mission, help them with the tools, help them do what they can do well. So this kind of belief that then is no then, then is an angel disguise coming to make a video so that other people could enjoy. That is a noble cause then. If you will have your life stopped, in order to help many people see this video, then what am I also, what is also my purpose? So we all have a certain kind of uh, play that is going on and we must accept it quickly because if we don't accept it, as I said in an article, one day the tooth will go on, your maker is calling you and you're like, oh no, I have to go and thank them. Oh no, I have to go and thank this person. Oh no, I have to. And you, so the best is to just uh, do your best with the people you meet, not wait until uh, they are no longer need you. Beautiful and, and, and very idealistic. I think people respond to idealism and, and authenticity. Uh, let me ask you about this painting, if I may, your great triptych about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Would you talk a bit about the painting, please? And the, this is a, a painting that when I started, when we started to talk, I was like, this uh, a kind of subject I took on. Uh, I, I am new in the country. Uh, how do I honor the country? And yet uh, show that, hey, with the opportunities that has come my way, at least I have, I'm using it to uh, do something. Uh, how do I honor people with the skill I have? So the initial idea was, was first honor the uh, country. And the second was to uh, show that if given the opportunity, one can paint. But of course, I wanted to take an old tradition and bring it to modern life. So it was inspired by the entombment more so than uh, just Martin Luther King. I was trying to imagine myself if I were to be living maybe 500 years ago, what will be the subject matter? Of course, it will be the entombment. So if now I live in my time and I want to paint the entombment, I, don't, I no longer have to have um, Jesus with uh, lion cloth uh, hanging there and there, but I can 
always uh, put normal people. But most of all, to Martin Luther King, I think sometimes we made a mistake by thinking he fought for black people. I really, did it. I really don't think Martin Luther King uh, fought for black people. I think he fought for humanity. Uh, he fought for this uh, suppressed. He will fight for Polish people if the Polish people are suppressed. He will fight for Indians if the Indians are suppressed. So this, I, I, I wanted to make sure I didn't have to put only blacks in the painting because uh, the idea that because he's black, therefore everyone who was there that time was black, didn't get to me that much. I wanted more of a symbolic uh, people, a symbolic painting that represents everybody rather than uh, black. So in this painting, you, you see that I have uh, blacks, uh, Asians and uh, Caucasians and uh, the mixed race, and then the typical uh, dark skin black. So this represents what he encompasses rather than uh, the idea he preached. I have a close up of the central panel here. Would you further comment upon race and any racial challenges that you may have faced in your own career, please? Um, racial challenges in my own career. Uh, the funny thing is that I want you to imagine something. Imagine uh, 10 of us from this village or 10 of us from this city. We are to evolve, we are to move on, we are to grow. And imagine because of weather, because of uh, food because of uh, hardship, we have to all go our way. Okay, so some went to the east, some went to the south, and some went to the west, and some went to the north. And then maybe a billion years later, we have to go and meet again. And we see that the diet of the people who went to the north have different color, have different shapes. The diet and struggle of the people who went south have different color and have different race. So imagine we met there and then all of a sudden we start to see ourselves differently. And then we start to kill ourselves because we look different. And we have forgotten that we all came from the same place. Imagine, imagine you kill one only because he looks different, but you forgot that there were only 10 of you who started this journey. And now you look different only because of evolution. Isn't it a joke for one to kill somebody knowing that once they were all the same? So racial problem, whenever I face it, I'm always like, oh, well, we were once the same and now you feel better. Do you know what we're gonna be tomorrow? I mean, we know if science, okay, science tells us we are all from the Neanderthals, right? Science, those who believe in science will say that. Those who also who believe in religion will say that we are all God's children. So we bring science, we are the same. We bring religion, we are the same. So aren't somebody a fool to kill his neighbor when everything says they are the same? That's one thing. The second thing, is there is no, I don't believe people are racist. I really, really don't. You can call me. And I believe there are hateful people hiding under the umbrella of racism. I believe people are so wicked, so bad with themselves that they would like to use a reason to kill because only when they use that reason, they will get the support. So for the reason, if B kills A because he hated A, no, B kills A because he's a hateful human being. And even if you take A out, you will find somebody else to kill. Look, we kill blacks, now we kill in Chinese. So wow, all of a sudden, it's no longer hate to blacks, now hate to Chinese. 
now we're gonna move on to what? The Jews, and then after we kill them, we're gonna move on to, then the pattern shows that it is hateful people. And I think they should just be called as such. Hateful people using an excuse to kill other people. If blast goes up, as I often would say, hate has a big appetite. And because hate has a big appetite, when it finishes with black, it's gonna go to the brown people. When it finishes with the brown, it's gonna go to the Jews. When it finishes with the uh, Jews, it's gonna go to the Italians. So until we see that it was not about blacks, but it was uh, hateful humans using hate as an excuse, we will not solve the problem. And therefore, when I face that, I don't call people, uh, oh, you are racist, that's why you treated me this way. No, I said, you are a hateful human. That's why you are behaving this way. When you reflect on your own experience in, in a creative sense, what do you feel is the, is the antidote for that to, to push back against the hate? Uh, I didn't your question again. When you reflect on the creative process on being an yeah. artist, yeah. On, on looking at the beauty of, of all people, which is what yeah. you've written about. You know, yeah. that everyone is beautiful. Every, that what, is, what is the solution? What is the healing power? Yeah. The thing is, uh, Dan, uh, a kid goes into a church and shoots nine people. A young kid, a beautiful young kid, beautiful, nice, beautiful kid. Is it because of a twisted ideology or the kid really, really hate people? It's a twisted ideology. A guy goes into Asian place and shoot people. Is it because of a twisted ideology or is it because of uh, the people? Okay, so the book argues that these kind of killers that we see around, it is a twisted ideology that has not been changed. And until we change that, we cannot help them see the best in us. Religion has done its best. Science is still doing its best. Sportsmen are doing their best. Entertainers are doing their best. Okay, what can we artists do? I mean, I look at you even with all this dark, uh, dark screen, I still see beautiful tones on you. Had artists really brought this beauty to the layman has, okay, people say, Sam, you know, there were skin tones before you were born. And yes, I know, I've seen paintings by many people, I know, but it has never become an agenda. It has never become a mission. It has never become, let's help the politicians. The job is too hard for them. The politicians are having a hard time to solve racial problems. The, Religion is having a hard time to solve racial problems. Sportsmen are having a hard time. When are we artists going to chip in? We have a tool that has not yet been enjoyed by the average. I went to France, not because of any reason, by the, but by the beauty that Monet has shown what France is. I went to Italy, not because of any reason, by but by the art that the Italian painters. So when you think of Germany, when you think of all these great places, most of us go to these places because of the beauty that we have locked. I mean, all the, <laughs> even till now, when I see Italians, I always forget that I'm talking to an Italian from, from uh, all because of that beauty. So then wouldn't it be nice for someone who lives in some of this hateful country to open a book, to open a painting book, to go to an exhibition that tells him how beautiful humanity is? What are we waiting for? Are we going to continually blame politicians when we're not doing anything? If your maker asks you, hey, Mr. Sam Arokoi, your talent that I gave you to use on it, what did you do to help the racial problem? 
You like to complain a lot. What did you do with your talent? Let's take writing out. Let's take everything out. Let's take the people you talk to out. What did your color experience do to help racial problem? So the book is uh, all the agenda or the mission is I just want artists. I want to beg them, beg them so much that the next time they confront a portrait, they should have in mind that somewhere, somehow, someplace, there will be some lonely guy who is willing, who is uh, wishing to join some hateful group. And hopefully that person could look at an image or go to an exhibition and realize, that, oh, wow, the Sam is not a black man. Look at the purples on his forehead. Look at the blues on his chin. Look at the uh, warm tones on Dan. Wow, now when I'm going to meet Dan, I'm no longer going to meet Dan. I'm meeting some colorful, beautiful uh, person. So it's more for a call to duty that artists should take on a mission just to help the politicians, the doctors, the sportsmen, the entertainers. Let's do something also at least for the times we're living in. Because the times we're living in, things are a little, things could get off, off hand very quickly. So at least let's give it a try. Re religion is trying all the time. The Dalai Lama is trying all the time. Churches are trying all the time to bring. What can we do with our color experience? Beautifully said, Sam, really beautifully said. And it's important to be able to have mature conversations about things like this. Uh, I just have to share from, from my own uh, perspective in drawing from, uh, we, we've had a program at the school to draw from cadavers, from bodies, yeah. from dissection. Yeah. And it's, it's so striking when there's no person there yeah. that it's not just that there's no life force, there's no, it's, it's, it's the beauty is partially missing. The beauty is, is really ethereal, like you said, it's intangible. Yeah. And to be able to paint somebody is to celebrate that intangibility and that, that kind of delicate, transient presence of the human body, yeah. uh, spirit and all. Because I imagine uh, that we are the only culture in this whole world where sometimes you can enter on a train and have maybe 10 different races on the same train. Ima just imagine, imagine Americans used to pay plane fare to go to France just to follow the footsteps of Monet. Wouldn't it be nice that one day, a day will come, people will come to America to go to a museum and see all the different people that lived in America. We, we go, I, I, I always, uh, every year I try to spend some time in uh, France. Just imagine that I started just going to France. I've been going there for 20 years now. All because of some Van Gogh's paintings of some uh, villages. Wouldn't it be nice for Americans to be so proud that, you know, go to America. You're gonna see paintings you've never seen before. You're gonna see blue people, black people, green people, and you will see their beautiful skin tone. Just imagine, and this is also reachable because we have the skill. We have the skill to do this. We, there's nothing at all getting in the way. And um, there are many great painters out there already. All what I beg for, let's channel some of our effort into celebrating humanity. Amen to that. Uh, I want to share a couple of things from your, your other book that I have, which is Skin Tones and Art, yeah. and share something intriguing, speaking of color and celebrating the individual and, and the skin tone, Seven Immortal Laws of Color. And law number one is cultivate your personal likes and dislikes. Would you talk about that a little bit, please? Uh, cultivate your... I wrote this so many, uh, so many Cultivate <laughs> years ago, but, but I think I have, I, I, I think what happened, uh, the reason why is I, I remember I never uh, send a full essay out because 
there was always spelling wrong. Friends would read it, oh, Sam, this grammar is wrong. So <laughs> I, was, I will always hide it. I have not yet found somebody to edit the full thing. This is a problem when you're a, where you, you're a fountain of wisdom and you say so many wise things. You lose track yeah. of all of the wisdom. So yeah. you the say, thing is, cultivate your personal likes and dislikes. Is, uh, it is very easy when we start to follow art. It is very easy to say, oh, I like impressionism. Oh, I don't like this. Oh, you know, I really, really like color. You know, I like when there's a red in this. I like when there's a blue. I think to be a very universal artist, you have to accept that all colors are there for a good reason. One color that you might not like, it is only because you don't understand it. If you are a student, it's because you don't know how to use it or you don't understand it, or because it is personal reasons. Or, but to, to be broad, to be universal, uh, all that you don't understand, cultivate your mind so that you will understand how to use it. It is like sometimes, as you know, maybe then uh, if we are around the same age, there used to be a time where people say, don't use black, don't use black, don't use black. But you realize that the only reason why they say don't use black is maybe they are afraid that you will overuse it and it will muddy things too much. And when I started teaching, I would say, hey, learn to use it well. So cultivating your mind in order to use color well is to know that the color wheel is all about balancing, adjusting, composing, and putting things together. And the color that you might not like might work in a different uh, environment than the colors you like. So. We're looking at uh, your amazing ballerina painting. Yeah. I'm thinking about what you just said and what I had read from John Ruskin where he says, too much the overuse of an innovative device vulgarizes the picture. So if you use too much of one thing, you kind of overuse it, you overplay it. Of course. Yes. Amazing details in this painting. Yeah, yeah, these are, uh, I, I painted this many few, I think when I, sometimes when I say, I, I remember painting an older man, he was 85. And I was, I think then I was maybe in my early thirties and I look at the painting, the painting was going very bad. And I look at him, he was 85. And I said to him, you know, I used to paint this faster when I was younger. <laughs> and the 80 year old looked at me and said, when you were younger, how old are you again, Sam? <laughs> so I, I painted this picture at the time when I was also intrigued by how show what you can do with the skill and the other, um, painting. So I, I think this is one of the few paintings that uh, in my early years, I spent a lot of time. I have, to, I, I have to admit that the corner was more of Shank's kind of influence. The, the ballerina, the, 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 how do you call it? The, their shoes for dancing, the dancing. Yeah, I think that were influence of uh, Shank's. Okay, let's check out Immortal Law of Color number two, become attuned to nature's arrangements. Oh, I love, this is my favorite actually. Um, beauty is everywhere, but beauty can hide from you when you don't know how to look at it. Uh, the old designers, uh, the old uh, fashion designers always used to get the ideas from nature. When you look at nature, on top, you'll be surprised to see how many of the colors are almost naturally arranged for you. So you, one can say, hey, if this is working in nature, then if I make notes of this combination that is working, I can use the same notes to compose my own picture. So nature, when in doubt, can give you more clues than and it's your, all the theories combined together. Like that beautiful background behind Dr. Robert Rivers. Yeah, it's a, one of the, I have to admit that one of the greatest human being I've ever painted. Um, very, very, very nice. A very beautiful, humble, humble, humble guy. He will, at his age, he will come all the way from New Jersey 
Sam, I'm all yours today. And uh, how do you want me to sit? You want me? And I see these are the kind of messengers to they come to you then to teach you yourself how to handle yourself. I see this guy who has accomplished everything and all the way telling me uh, what do you saying, what do you want? What should I do? Should I go and get you coffee? And I, I'm like, oh my God, I hope uh, I will forever uh, learn and keep some of these values that he impacted on me. The other time I, I was like, oh Sam, you know, we're coming to New York City. We wanna come and visit you just to sit down and talk. <laughs> and uh, it is humbling when you see accomplished people that humble, not faking. Okay, there's a different. Uh, you can I I can fake to be humble. Many can fake. This sincere man uh, taught me how it does not take anything at all away from you to be super humble to people, and therefore he taught me more than I bargain for. Speaking of superhuman people with humility and great accomplishment, we have the amazing Colleen Berry <laughs> at 14. At, Colleen at 14, I think uh, we, it goes back a long way. So I think, I hope that most of your audience know Colleen, is, uh, she's now uh, an amazing artist. And Colleen is really helping also get on this uh, skin tone project uh, thing. So Colleen has been super helpful and she's gonna be uh, joining me to do a lot of things. So, and um, I have a French girl from, uh, um, I think a French girl from Paris, uh, Ines Longeville, and she too and Colleen, uh, right from the very beginning, when I announced the skin tone project, the first thing they were like, hey, Sam, let's help you out here. And they use their uh, social media to start to promote the thing. I have to admit that for the past three months, I put the idea aside for a bit because I realized that I was no show at all on social media. So I was like, well, let me build a certain kind of uh, presence uh, before uh, going back to uh, the project just so I don't abuse the, I don't make so much noise when there's no one to go there. But they have, Colin and Ines have really been super helpful. Wonderful. Uh, Colleen's amazing. She draws like an angel and she's brilliant. So if yeah. you don't know her work, you've got to check her out. Third law of seven. Law number three, develop a timeless taste develop a timeless taste. You know, uh, in our culture, uh, almost every year, there's a new color in town. Hey, now everybody's wearing green, you have to wear green. Now everybody's wearing orange, and then everybody goes and get orange. There is nothing at all wrong with that. I think fashion and Vogue are here to stay, and uh, it could be nice if we are all uh, fashionable or whatever you like you do. But when it comes to painting, we always have to realize that painting goes beyond fashion. Painting goes beyond uh, people. So there are some color combinations that if composed well, if painted well, have very timeless quality. And you cannot just paint what you like and expect to have that timeless quality or to force people to have that. So what you do, what I suggest with uh, that law is to learn the colors that creates timeless look. And of course, we, we don't have that much time to explain in details, the combination, the wheel, what goes well, what has worked before, what works in the Egyptian time, what works in the Renaissance time and still working. How come some things were beautiful during the Egyptian time and it's still beautiful now? How come some, if then, if something used to be beautiful in Egyptian time and it's still beautiful now, if something is beautiful during the Renaissance time and is beautiful now, then 
those rules and the formulas or the combination could also be learned and used now. And that's what that law tells us. It's a beautiful thing to say because it goes to every aspect of the way you choose the shape, every, even, areas, everything. If everything, even, even post is the way we post people. They are timeless posts and they are just uh, posts for the sake of posting. And I, I, I mean, I had always uh, believed or I had always pursued, even my writing, I always pursued things that are, that are timeless instead of just, I have nothing against something of the season, but I tend to gravitate to uh, theories or ideas that endures forever. And that's why even the origin of inspiration, <laughs> I thought actually, after all the abuse that I got, I thought, oh, maybe hopefully if I can sell a few thousands, I'll be okay. Then all of a sudden, the book went sold out within the first year and we have to print it again. So that kind of timeless quality is often what I always pursue. Marvelous. Next law, master the art of composition. Master the art of composition. When I was younger, uh, I hope there's no 90 year old listening and say, Sam, you're still young. So <laughs> <laughs> when I was in school, I remember uh, as a, a young artist, I used to think composition is diagonal line going crossing the canvas big shape of the some few little things back and forth and i used to think that was what composition meant okay i never thought composition means arrange rearranging compose keep composing until it becomes meditative hypnotic to the point where one cannot stop looking at the painting Composition was not just dramatic diagonal line, but composition actually means things that have been composed so well that once you start looking at it, you are forced to be directed to what the artist wants you to see. If I want you to uh, look at her face and never to go out of the canvas, how do I compose shapes around that Everything always leads to where I want, and everything leads you not off the canvas, but back and forth off the canvas. So composition, the rules of composition, when uh, played with a lot, you will see that there are ways of putting things together, images together, shapes together, lines together, colors together, values together, in order to achieve a certain holistic look or a certain holistic beauty that gravitates you that you can never stop looking at the painting. It's uh, not just about line, it's about shapes, values, color, tones, lines, um, um, well, um, I think you guys uh, get the message. Yeah, I cannot support that statement enough. I think it would even be impossible to overstate the importance yeah. of learning your composition. It's everything. Let's go to the next law, law number five. You say turn chromatic and exaggerated colors into beautiful art. The, the, uh, the thin chromatic colors, I, I, yeah, I remember uh, some uh, a guy once was in my car. And I, I, we started painting, and he, he might have come from the background, very soft, muted, tame, idealized colors. And I said to him, my friend, you should work with the colors. And I, I said something like, I didn't want to like go extreme on him. So I was like, hey, maybe the class is also about um, improving your color sense, how to mix colors, how to compose them and how to use color, how to mix, how to use and how to compose. 
So he said, but I have the colors that the model is having. And he said, no, your skin tone is too dark and your shirt is, and he said, but Sam, no, this is the colors. So I took the brush and showed him what the, the colors are that are going on. <laughs> he took a brush from my hands and I move on to the next person. By the time I came back to him, he sparked his stuff and left. <laughs> and, and he said to my monitor that these are so strange colors, I cannot uh, believe he will be painting like this and I don't like these colors. And he left. Okay, let's assume that because of his background and because of where I'm coming from, meaning that the tradition, that the impressionistic realistic tradition is too harsh for him. All what he has to do as a student is to learn, if I want this guy to teach me, then are there some things maybe I'm hanging on to too long that maybe he could help me with, but he didn't have that approach. What happened is a garish color could be the most beautiful color in a composition, if it is balanced well. I always tell my students, one key word you should always keep in mind composing is balancing. Nothing is bad. What is bad is how things are balanced. If you think you like a certain color in the picture, don't fall in love with it, but make sure it works within the picture. So it is that kind of balancing and not balancing that makes one color too garish or sometimes too gray, because a gray could be the most beautiful color if just opposed with a certain garish color. Uh, then also you have a different approach where people want color so much that they are willing to just go for it, go for it, go for it until it becomes a little too candy. Okay, if candy is not bad, then you don't, you should eat candy, but don't eat it all the time. Because we also know when we think of the timeless qualities in painting, we realize that when things are too sweet, people cannot take it for so long. People tend to digest things that they can take more often. So a garish color often will have that kind of uh, effect where it could be too sweet to pass for time. This sounds like, if I may segue into another question, of course, of course. this sounds like one of the things that you would say to a beginner, to a student. Is this how you approach students when you talk to them about color? Is it one of the fundamental conversations? Uh, most of my students in the beginning is about mixing, actually. Um, um, some of these things that I'm talking about, uh, composition is about how you compose shapes, how you compose values, how you compose lines, and how you compose uh, color. Uh, it, it is a little too much to push on the beginner. A beginner just want to mix beautiful nuances and uh, wants to be able to maintain the palette and be able to uh, go back and forth within a certain kind of range of colors. So I will not actually the composition, uh, the seven laws of color might not be, uh, might be something a beginner must read, but the exercises to get there might be a total different exercises because I don't want a student who cannot mix the nuances of blue to be worrying too much about a lot of things. So my guess is uh, beginners have different exercises. Uh, my goal with a beginner is just uh, how to mix clean colors but also how to sharpen up your vision more, how to observe colors. Uh, pushing colors for a beginner, I'm always afraid that they might take it overboard and then it's hard for them to get it out of their system. So I love nature, as I said, the beauty of nature and therefore in imitation of nature can actually help a student improve their skills more than ideally uh, doing things just because it will make something strong. For a, for a beginner, 
how to maintain your palette, how to mix colors, how to put pictures together, how to organize your painting, how to finish a painting. Then at that level, they will be more in tune or uh, ready to learn some other rules. I, uh, sometimes some people, it will take them a year or two years to start to understand what maybe arrangement of shapes really, really means. Exactly. Let's talk about law number six. Quote, overcome the myth that good color sense can't be learned. Uh, I am from the school of, or I am from the belief that all things in life could be learned. Just because you cannot be a great artist, does not mean you didn't have that much talent. It just means that maybe your interest wasn't there. It just means that you didn't make a good deal with the universe. It just means that you have maybe different goals. It means that not everybody have different, the same uh, mission. But if you are to be good, as good as you want to be, the means are there. The knowledge, the wisdom, the experience are there. So the myth of color is the old school beliefs. Ah, you cannot be a colorist if uh, you are not born with a color sense. Actually, uh, in, in the book, the, I think, yeah, in the a short story of skin tones, there's a, a short essay about color blindness. There's a story about Hami Sawyer. I don't, I'm sure some of you know Hami Sawyer. And Hami Sawyer went and studied with one of the strongest colorists in Denmark. And Hami Sawyer was in his, in this colorful class. And for some weird reason, it's hard to tell why will Hami Sawyer, who is a color blind artist, be in this strong colorist environment. But then the myth can go back and say, why did this artist who accepted this guy who doesn't want to use color in his class? This teaches, uh, teaches us the sense of great, great, great teachers. He allowed Hamid Sawyer there, and he believes that if the guy wants to be here, I'm not going to force him. I'm not going to impose if he cannot mix the color, if he is colorblind, that's nature's fault. What he wants for his life is my duty to offer him what I could offer him. This goes back to what I said before. In life, you meet wanderers, you meet seekers, you meet people on their journey, and your goal is just to help them find their path with all the tools that they can take and they can accept and they can consume. Your goal is not to impose what he, the person's do wants to be. Lo and behold, Hami Sawyer graduated from the school and he became one of the greatest artists ever lived in Denmark. So imagine that somebody that could be called a color blind in one place was, became a great artist. So if you are a color blind, it just means that whatever you have is being reduced down to a very limited ways of seeing color. And we go back to balancing. All what you have to do with that limited way is to compose well within your reach, is to organize well within your reach and use that. You must not, you don't have to worry about uh, someone as color. What if, uh, someone is copying you and said, oh, wow, I like his muted tones. But you are copying a colorblind artist, so that might not be good for you. But that's what I mean by the idea that you are born with color. That's not as you can learn to, uh, you can learn to know all the rules of color and you can use it as you wish. If you think you cannot learn, uh, you're doing yourself, actually, you're taking away from the talent you've been uh, gifted with. Understood. Let's talk about your seventh law, which is to learn to explore elements of color. 
the elements or the pillars of color. Um, you know, then uh, one thing I have noticed when I, uh, with most uh, young uh, students is we get involved into a certain kind of ideology or idea, this is me, I don't want anything to change me, this is me, this is me, this is me. It is very hard to bring that to color. There are many, many laws out there. There are many, many rules out there. There are many, many styles out there. It is not a bad idea that as you study how to paint, it, when you're studying to paint, then you are studying like a doctor. You are studying to know how to paint. What you do with that when you get out of school is a total different thing. While you are studying how to paint, it's not gonna hurt to value all the elements that makes great painting, drawing, uh, color and composition. What most students do is they dismiss certain parts of the grammar of painting. Oh, column is easy. I will learn column when I finish. The law, I mean, do you know how hard the loss of color is if you are to create timeless art? Do you know how hard it is to be colorful if you are to mix beautiful colors? So. The idea that, oh, I, I wanna concentrate more on drawing and I will do composition one day. I will do, this always comes back to haunt most painters. So while in school, it's not a very, it's not a bad idea to also explore the grammar of color, explore the rules out there. You might not need to use them, but they will come handy when you need them. And law seven say, explore those things while you are still studying. Or even, even for that matter, when you find out that, hey, you know, I think my color sense is not very, very sharp. What will Sam do? Okay, let me start to improve on my color sense. Let me read out there, let me seek for the masters of the field. Let me, what about Cezanne? What about Matisse? What about the painters you know? What about all the colorists ever live? But because we don't explore, or because we are hanging on to a certain uh, dogma, we then cheat ourselves for never, uh, for never ever having the skill of using the color. Beautiful. And I love what you say in Origins of Inspiration here, which I quoted, no great achievements happen by accident. Although on the surface, it may appear that way. There are a lot of artists that talk about the power of ambiguity and making something look easy. None of it's easy. None of it is accidental, right? Of course. It's, if, uh, it's, it's, it's very, very fun. I always say that Try to go and paint like sergeant with no skill. You'll be hanging yourself, you, you'll hang yourself to death. Try to go and throw your strokes around like Franz Horst. When you haven't drawn the head for a while, you, you, you'll be a frustrated, bitter artist. Nothing easy that comes from great masters are uh, easy. It is something, it's an illusion. Uh, I remember some, once a student came to me and said, or oh, Sam, I am in your class to learn your broad strokes. And I don't really, really want to draw the model. I just want to learn the broad strokes, like the way you paint flowers. And I look, <laughs> it was when I look at her and I say, wow, you're a very smart woman. I wish I was this one when I was younger. <laughs> <laughs> you know exactly what my are. And you, you just want to come to my class and get that and move on. And you don't want to draw. So I said to her that everything I know came from drawing and therefore I have to teach you how to draw and then teach you how to handle the brush and then teach you the grammar of brush strokes. If I cannot teach you the grammar of brush strokes and sometimes the grammar of brush strokes will not come from painting. It might come from charcoal works. 
It might come from pen and ink work. It might come from pencil. If you don't wanna do all that, why do you think you could master the broad strokes? Of course, she left. And <laughs> later on, I heard her saying to other students in the other class that, you know, he paints all these beautiful flowers, but when you go to his class, he gives you things to draw. And that's not fair. <laughs> so the thing is, you, you have to understand that there is some underlying structure. There is some underlying knowledge, an informed mind trying to make easy statements. And this is, uh, then this is very common in writing. Sometimes you write a page, you reduce the page down to two paragraphs, then you reduce it down to one, and then you still struggle to try to get shorter. Uh, like the uh, story about Satire who was on the street smiling to everybody he meets. And lo and behold, he met two friends and he was like, oh guys, I have to buy you a drink. I am the most happiest man alive. And the friends were like, this guy used to be a bitter guy. He's always have a dirty face looking at everybody. Why is he so happy today? And they asked him, Mr. Sata, why are you so happy? And he like, I was able to put three words together beautifully today, and I'm so happy. So sometimes the three words that he had put in together might have come from a page. Painting is like that. You cannot just say that just because Franz Haas is throwing the strokes around, sagging all over the place, zone all over the place. Therefore, you two have, have to follow rather than understand how it's done. And the brush stroke, my little pamphlet on brush strokes, you, you, you will start to see that actually the thing you see as a pen and ink is actually underneath the great paintings that you will see. Beautifully said, exactly, the underpinnings. Let me, uh, this is the last quote that I have for you uh, and from your book, Origins of Inspiration. We are no match for the spell passion casts upon us. Money gives us means to afford things. Prizes and recognition give us fame, which is sometimes a certain kind of happiness in society. Only passion gives us a powerful emotion, a supreme strength and the enduring energy to fulfill our duty. What do you feel our duty is, Sam? Um, we go back to the universe and the law of our nature. Say, if you rent a house, you have to keep the house clean. You have to keep it clean for the house to endure for a long time. Why were we given this talent then? Why Sam from nowhere, nobody few years back, nobody knew. Why was Sam given a talent? Why, why would then all of a sudden be responsible of sharing Sam's idea to the ideas to the world? Why? These questions should not lead anybody anywhere than to say that you are giving the talent for a certain reason. Now we have to find that reason. So far as I'm concerned, I cannot tell what others should do. I think it will be very uh, uh, bad on me. I think it's very disrespectful to look at somebody who I don't know their pains, their worries, their, their worries and everything and impose on them. But I know that if the uh, talent that nature has given me came from powers beyond my control, should there be some need that I was given the talent to pursue? I believe that the world that I came and met is the most beautiful world ever. The people that I'm meeting are the most beautiful people I've ever met. Even the, the, the ones that didn't do what I would like them to do still taught me some lessons that I need in my journey. So what therefore should I use my talent to 
better the world I came and met. We know evolution continues. We know as evolution continues, it comes with rough edges. It is hard for us to accept the new things. It is hard for us to accept the new everything, behavior and everything. So if evolution comes in, evolution with nature comes in to give us things that often are not ready to use, shouldn't my talent to be the means that could make things get used well? So for this reason, I believe my talent is to help others. It is not a talent given to me. It's a talent to help in hope that I will survive in return, eat my eat, pay my rent, do what the average person do. That should never be taken off the plate. But in return, the surplus, when I do what gives me the means to live well, not live well, just live, eat, pay my medical things and everything. What do I do with the surplus talent I have? And this is why I believe that all artists should have a certain kind of servitude approach to life and should kind of be a little bit more concerned. I, I think it, it would be very egotistic for Sam to say that, oh God, I'm so talented, I am the best, you guys worship me, I will paint anything I want and you guys will just take it. It will be super egotistic. Nobody is, nobody goes far with that belief. What did Gandhi did with his talent to communicate? What did Gandhi did with his talent to know what the laws are? Uh, what did Socrates did with the mind he had? What, it, what did great people do with the mind? Why can't we also have that kind of servitude approach to life and say that, you know, I don't mind sometimes having some few paintings for therapeutic reason. I don't mind sometimes painting for the sake of making money, I have to pay my rent. But after the painting for making uh, money to survive, after painting for um, some therapeutic reason, after painting to be happy, what else should I use the rest of my talent for? How should I serve people? And for this reason, I believe artists also have obligation. Don't we ask the politicians to be obliged to do something good? We ask the police to be good police, right? We ask the doctors to be good uh, doctors. A doctor can say that, hey, come to my uh, office and look at my awards. I am the greatest doctor, but I forgot to give you the wrong medication. So why do we always expect every profession to do something to help humanity. But when it comes to us, we want to have this selfish approach. It's me, 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 I'll paint beautiful, I don't care. So I believe we have the duty to help the universe or humanity evolve peace, uh, peacefully. After all, in the end of the day, artists tend to see the future more before even the future comes. So if we can see the future before future comes, can we then for create that by the time the future comes, we have prepared uh, people for it. As the Skin Tone Project will say, we know where the world is going doesn't look pretty. We know hate is hate with its big, uh, big appetite loves exotic colors. So once he finishes his appetite, he nibbles on exotic colors. When I finish you know, killing the bus, I will go and nibble on some Asians. When I finish with the Asian, Hey God, I'm gonna go to this place and shoot some people around. So we know the future doesn't look good. Are we gonna sit down and then wait until the future comes and say, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. Oh, we should also take certain kind of servitude, attitude that when I pay some pictures, intentionally, I will love people to feel this, to see this, or to have this, whether in a very graphic way or in a very passive way, but we should have a, we, we should really have a certain kind of concern 
about what the future is going to be. And we should try to use our talent to cure and fix and put some things in line before. We should, we should really take it upon ourselves that we too must chip in and be helpful to society. I have to say, Sam, that sitting with you for two hours makes the future look a lot brighter. I think it, uh, then I think it's gonna be, the, the time, the moment we take on that skin tone project then, because there are so many beautiful minds out there. I know so many beautiful painters out there. You are one of them. I mean, see the opportunity you are giving me to spread the word. So there are too many beautiful minds and beautiful painters out there for this mission to fail. I really do. Uh, everybody eventually, when things put together and everything is in line, I think uh, we will have, artists will make a difference. This is, this. I'm not saying this for, I don't know how to say it, but it, it's one of these things that I strongly believe in then. I really, 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 really do. If nobody joins, I will keep doing it. It comes through, Sam. I mean, you yeah. are a person of great wisdom and great faith and great idealism and uh, I can't tell you how much of a wonderful experience it's been to sit and share ideas with you and listen to you uh, speak. And I, I want to, uh, if I may, just remind the audience of, of Sam's amazing books, especially the ones that I have with me called Origin of Inspiration. And they can get it from originofinspiration.com. Oh, yes. And then how do they get a short story on skin tones in art? How do they get that? And the same, Origin of Inspiration has all the books. Okay, I would encourage uh, everyone to uh, not only get them, but to share them and to open them up and to share ideas with each other. And um, it's, it's just been a fantastic experience, Sam. I can't thank you enough. It's been wonderful. Uh, no, I, uh, the thanks actually goes straight back to you. I think uh, a word um, in my chest or in my head is nothing. I think, I, I mean, I love the fact that the killers, the young killers that goes in and do mass shooting. I love the fact to believe that they are just misinformed. Uh, can we bring art of humanity to them? Yes, we can. And I think uh, we should try, at least we are artists, let's try something. I think the idea that we stay on our high horse and I am the greatest, I'm paid concocted uh, pictures and this, Yes, you should do whatever you like, but let's help evolution advance. Yeah, it, it goes to a, a deeper subtext of salvation in creativity. Yeah. Right. It's salvation just, uh, is right there. Well, uh, well, what will your salvation be when you finish painting? Yes. Yeah. It's what painting has brought to you.